Uh, well, I think that, I mean, culture matters. Like we culture, we take so seriously. It structures our decision-making. It structures what we do. Um, but when we do transportation analysis, we almost always just cut it out and reduce all the behaviors to um, kind of socioeconomic behaviors, right? Like how big is your family? How much money, you know, are you making? Do you have a car? Um, and uh, and I think that it it takes away from the you know the the nuance and the richness of how people make decisions, um, you know, uh, decisions that are not. Um, that seem inefficient, right? Like that will people drive a long way for, you know, certain amenities. Uh, that's often explained by cultural reasons, right? Like, um, you know, uh, you have an immigrant community and um, uh, second generation people from that community who have, you know, um, done quite well, move out to, you know, say, uh, you know, f further away suburbs, but continue to come in for religious services or for food or for, um, you know, like shopping needs. And and it seems inefficient. We wouldn't, you know, uh, expect that trip to happen, but it reflects a strong, you know, cultural need. And, and so that's where people are like looking for, you know, where culture affects their choices. But in general, also like our behaviors are very culturally driven. Um, and I think a lot of why we've struggled to change behaviors is that we we don't acknowledge the role of culture in our decision making. I'm so glad you're asking. I, I mean, I think that um, the, the kind of quantitative data that we collect is really useful and I obviously, you know, really like it. Um, but it doesn't tell us often why, you know, like, why is someone doing this or, you know, and that, um, uh, you know, so in planning, it's really important to understand the stories, the, the, you know, the perceptions that are motivating decisions and data, I would have been like, I would have not seen that really what could be the biggest kind of impact on changing um, the, you know, how people get to campus is providing a way for people to get to Manhattan uh, that they don't need a car. So they don't bring a car in the first place. And, you know, the kind of understanding of those stories, um, you know, won't be there unless we, um, you know, did mixed methods research where we complemented our data collection, our, our quantitative data with the qualitative understanding of, you know, what, you know, what are people thinking? Why are they making the decisions? What's important to them? Um, and, you know, certainly for, um, if you want to do effective planning, you really need to, um, you know, talk to people to know uh, what's going on. And so, yes, qualitative data is is critical. You know, in terms of convincing policymakers, um, it, it both have their role, right? Like a compelling story um, can be, you know, very important for, say, um, you know, a politician who's trying to, you know, convince their peers about, you know, which way to, to go uh, with a difficult policy decision. Um, and that kind of anecdotal data is, and information is really, you know, necessary. On the other hand, sometimes people need the quantitative data. So again, back to Manhattan, uh, my students participated in an annual um, bike and ped count. And the data that we collected demonstrated how when the city invested in resources, people were using them. And so the quantitative data affirmed the value of those investments and enabled the city to, you know, feel okay about doing it and investing more. But, um, you know, often it takes the qualitative information about like, you know, people's experiences, say walking to school or, or not, that motivates, you know, um, some initial players to, to try out something new. And so, um, so there's different audiences and different information, you know, can, can resonate. I, I don't want to make any kind of normative statements about like, you know, what they should do, but I think that, um, you know, we've been struggling to move the needle on a lot of, um, you know, policies that are more sustainable. And I think that looking at, um, you know, cultural components at pro-social behaviors, um, you know, could, could make a difference. I mean, I think, I think that like, say the uptake of, of electric vehicles, it's, 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 I mean, the genius, I think, of Elon Musk is to make them a status symbol and to make them fancy. Um, and, you know, and that 
suddenly like you know having an electric vehicle is not like a lesser option it's the fancy option and um you know that was quite interesting to kind of see how it um came about but i i think that you know reframing a lot of our um policies in terms of you know helping communities succeed and succeed together um i think is compelling policies in terms of you know helping communities succeed and succeed together um i think is compelling and um uh you know um and so kind of leveraging pro social sentiment in you know to create more walkable uh you know um streetscapes or to include you know play spaces uh where a vacant lot might have been um you know can can really serve important needs and also nourish, I think, the part of humans that want to connect and want to make our communities better. And so, you know, I think that, um, you know, what what I certainly saw a lot in, in, you know, in a smaller town community where people had strong social connections is that, you know, people that that came into play at like a, you know, almost a citywide level. Um, but I do think that, you know, here in Baltimore, you know, and a lot of our students are doing stuff to try to cultivate um local initiatives that that uh bring people together to make those communities nicer happier safer um you know more livable 